Up next, we have uh, Bing Long, who I've had the pleasure of working with for about a year now. Uh, Bing's been working in the industry, industrial AI and IoT space for pretty much the past decade, and uh, brings an interesting combination of business business background and applied AI, AI background. Um, he attended University of Cambridge in the UK in economics and got his MBA at University of Chicago, um, and for the past 10 years has been building out applied AI solutions for everything from predictive maintenance to fish finders to energy optimization. Um, and actually, you know, while Bing was at University of Chicago, he helped create one of the first machine learning courses for MBA students, um, which is now at University of Chicago. Is I mean, it's not a lot of schools, but it is one of the top machine learning courses that emerges business and apply AI. So, Bing? Hi, great. Uh, thank you, Nick. And, uh, hello. Uh, it's great to, uh, uh, to serve you um, in a new role uh, this afternoon. And um, in a way, I'm, I'm hugely, you know, massively grateful that I am going uh, to talk right after uh, Dr. Ryan Ghani and uh, Dr. David Banks because the, the, the context that they have set up will uh, mitigate the risk of me going uh, a lot of the time. So uh, I will talk about the concept of trustworthy AI from a, 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 a very practical angle. I, I, I'm going to talk about um, how people working in government are thinking about this and asking us to do things in response to what they demand and how should we think about um, meeting those uh, requirements. Actually, can I get a clicker from uh, the slide? Oh. <laughs> so, now, um, in terms of policy making in, in America, um, when was the last time did you see any major law passed without a lot of nasty debate and, and, and you know, uh, of, of back and forth uh, in not a nice way. Okay. And it seems to me that since, you know, January 6, uh, 2000, uh, 20, uh, 2021, you know, nothing has passed in, in a major way without uh, somebody uh, saying something that is not pretty, right? But just five days um, before that, uh, People passed this, and and it was a, a piece of legislation that received, uh, I would say, wide acclaim, and and there has there has been a lot of commentary on this piece of legislation called the National AI Initiative Act, right? Which was part of the uh, 2020 budget um, passed on January 1st, 2021. But most of the commentary has been positive. Right? People just agree that this is necessary and timely. Right? And regardless of uh, what value system, uh, what political inclination you subscribe to. And the, the real reason why there was a, a lot of urgency uh, and, and timeliness uh, for this uh, was this, right? That, 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 there was a, a, a real sense uh, by the, the users and the observers as well and the, the developers and managers of AI systems um, that um, AI left unregulated can do pretty bad things, right? can do things that are dangerous, or offensive, or unfair. So that necessitated a, a regulatory uh, framework um, to demand that uh, collectively the government agencies as well as private enterprises uh, create and operate so-called trustworthy AI systems. And so, so the law that was passed uh, got translated to, operationally to this website AI.gov run by the, the Office of the National AI Initiative. Right? And uh, I, I zap this, um, this screen of, of the homepage of that website just like 73, uh, 72 hours ago. Right? And 
a scan through uh, through the home page can reveal what the key concerns are. Right? The, um, this uh, agency is highly concerned with making sure AI is trustworthy. Uh, they are concerned with safety. Uh, they want to mitigate risk. And so, um, uh, when the law was first passed, and um, I, I kind of um, brought it up during lunch with Christopher. Right? I said, oh, I heard some commentary from, uh, from Google, from Amazon, from CMU, from U Chicago about uh, various expert opinions uh, on this law. Uh, so he just threw me a bucket of cold water saying, just, just throw away all those secondary commentaries. Just go read through the whole thing and tell me what it is about. And it was, uh, it was like, why did I have to bring it up? Because this piece of document was uh, the whole thing, the budget document containing this chapter of 2,000 pages, right? Um, the, the AI section was about 200, 300 pages, but then there are other chapters with AI, uh, trustworthy AI requirements sprinkled all around, right? So in total, uh, I had to read through about 600 pages. Right. And um, so, so uh, after I, I, I quickly looked and, 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 and calculated, um, I threw it back to the and said, no, no boss, uh, not 600. Um, you do 300, I do 300, and then we can compare notes. And um, we got something very interesting, right? So there, there are lots of dense texts uh, around this concept of trustworthy AI. And various uh, agencies, various, various people contributing to the, the writing uh, use different words. Uh, mention, uh, mentioning different aspects of what, what kind of AI systems are considered uh, partially or very trustworthy. So we, uh, between Christopher and myself, two geeks, two data scientists uh, by trade, we, we did some clustering analysis. And we came up with these six um, largely uncorrelated um, clusters of concern. Right? So uh, on the screen there, the, the words that we associated uh, together in, in each cluster. So there is a cluster for validation verifiably. There is a, a cluster down here with safety, privacy, uh, cluster over there with control, controllability. Right? So, so these are the things that we believe are the uh, simpler, uh, simple but not any simpler uh, way of interpreting this act then we, it, it occurred to us that even this level of uh, simplification of, um, you know, of, of uh, principal component analysis is not actionable yet to developers and managers you know, doing our day-to-day -day job, right? How, how can one remember all of this? There's, 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 no, there's no way um, I can go to sleep with this and then wake up in, in the morning and saying the same thing, right? So uh, we took one further step. Well, we did some, some wordplay, summarizing these ideas into something more memorable. Uh, it's called AI rule. A-I-R-U-L-E. Um, standing for auditable, um, idealizable, uh, regulable, uh, understandable, um, lockable, uh, and explainable. So this, this is uh, what I would call the the developer's way of remembering what the law says. And um, there's, no time, there's not enough time in this talk to go through all of this, so I will just um, quickly touch on some key uh, aspects um, uh, of these uh, qualities. Right? Uh, so auditable is all about the ability to record in, in high fidelity what the system actually does. Per case, right? per, per example, uh, when, when it produces predictions, um, explainable, understandable, uh, are kind of well understood, right? Because there has been a lot of, um, of talk about explainability and interpretability of the system. And then on the right hand side there, uh, the qualities of idealizable um, and, and regulable um, concerns the ability of the developers of the system to make the system fair or unbiased, as well as um, to infuse the system with domain expertise to to overcome the limitations that machine learning natively cannot um, can, cannot uh, overcome. 
So now, if you notice that there are actually a few clusters uh, among these um, that are not going to be um, satisfiable with data alone, right? Um, I can argue that these three qualities on the right here, idealizable, uh, regulable, understandable, need um, a, a significant amount of human expertise and human knowledge right, to do well. You, you cannot build idealizable or fair uh, systems. You cannot build regulable, controllable systems uh, without uh, any um, input uh, from the human ex uh, experts. So what I'm going to do for the rest um, of the talk is um, to give some concrete examples about what people have been trying to do um, with human knowledge in order to, to hopefully make their system more idealizable, um, more regulable, more understandable. Right? And, and for the remaining qualities that are um, not natively you know, knowledge uh, driven, um, we, we can, uh, we can uh, talk more about those at the break uh, for, uh, for, for anyone who would like to, uh, to, to, to chat and exchange views on those. Uh, so for idealizable systems, um, conveniently, uh, I think I can now borrow a lot from what David and, and, and Ray uh, shared just uh, uh, an hour ago. Um, actually, there, there are a lot of um, uh, good techniques now being uh, thought about and starting to be implemented in open source and, and in academia in, as well as in, uh, in, in the technology firms uh, for uh, adjusting the data sources as well as adjusting the model uh, building techniques to make the system more fair. Right? So I, um, I, I put uh, on the screen here one uh, article uh, that was published last year that contains a, a fairly well thought out technical framework about how to make a, a significant machine learning pipeline more, more de-biased, more fair. And this is a use case in uh, life sciences. So um, it is uh, it's an interesting read uh, for, for those who, who want to uh, check out how they, uh, they, how they think through and how to execute. Um, case study number two, um, self-driving car. So uh, let me play this video and, and talk through um, what we can infer or what we can see from it. So this is a video from 2021. Uh, this is, I think, in Taiwan, I believe. Uh, that, that's a self-driving car right there, right? That's the white one. And um, well, it, 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 it went straight into a rollover truck. So it is, it is, I mean, it, it was a sensational video. A lot of people just conveniently say, oh, that, that's n never a trust a self-driving car. Right? But to, to me, a geek, right? when we look at this, there are a lot of things that, 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 that we can um, infer from this. First of all, um, to me, this is a scene that is very simple for humans. Right? Straight road, you know, there's an obstacle over there. It can be seen from 100 meters away. It's straightforward to stop right? and, 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 and deal with it. But to a data scientist, it is actually a very hard exercise. Right? Because out of billions of miles of data that you can collect from these kind of cars, how many miles, how many meters of, of data actually have a rollover truck? Right? As a percentage of the training data bank. So it is actually very hard for, for deep learning developers um, to, to, to incorporate the truck. Right? So, um, as a as a um, as a as a direction to make uh, the first uh, the, the next generation driving system safer, which of the two you think is more workable? Right. I, I think it is not workable to to try to train and retrain um, a deep learning system uh, to to become bigger, better uh, to, to 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 avoid such uh, corner cases. It is much more workable to do something that, let's say, uh, uh, Dr. Gupta in the morning says, you know, you build hybrid system combining deep learning models with some knowledge-based models, uh, logical models, common sense, and, and deal with those uh, in a faster, uh, more practical manner. 
A third case study um, about understandable industrial um, uh, AI system. This is a use case that is very close to my heart. This is about predictive maintenance, about predicting faults in machines. Right? So uh, I'm presenting up here a particular solution architecture that actually not only is the, the main way that we we have seen so far, after so many years of producing an effective fault prediction, and not just a normal detection, but also produces a system that is very uh, understandable, very very uh, easy to um, share with another person what it does. Right? So in this system, the, the way we uh, build predictive maintenance fault prediction uh, AI is to, to start with a domain expert. right? And, and extract from the domain expert a model called the teacher model, uh, capturing the essence about what they know about certain critical faults in machines. And we use that teacher model to, to train a machine learning or a deep learning model mimicking the predictive capability of the teacher. And then we, we try to combine these two models, teacher and student, in some ensemble way that, that gets the best out of, of them and then end up with a final fault predictor that can be deployed to the field. Right? So, so the process itself uh, does involve a lot of data processing in model training steps, but structurally, this is a very simple to understand technique. And, and if we put, deploy this to the field and something doesn't go quite right, it's quite easy to debug and, and, and troubleshoot. Right? So this is a, uh, a good example that useful and understandable AI system. So, um, we are out of time, but uh, I'm going to leave you with this um, uh, small checklist uh, uh, for developing a trustworthy AI system as a developer or as a manager. Right? First of all, there are two websites that are quite useful um, to, um, to, to, to use to, to keep ourselves updated about what, what uh, lawmakers are, are considering. Uh, with regards to um, trustworthy AI, so AI.gov, and the website by, by NIST, the, the standards body. And then two key questions you can ask um, yourself or your developers, um, how, how AI rule is your system, right? The, how many qualities of AI rule does your system have? And then finally, where, where is knowledge? Do you, does the system have any significant amount of knowledge to be trustworthy? So, thank you. Thank you, Benny. I think it's uh, it's important to take that framework you have and understand where where data is not going to be enough to uh, to really meet the the ever changing uh, regulations, and we'll need to introduce knowledge into that. Um, so let's take a, a couple of questions from the audience and any online. I think maybe we'll just do an online real quick. Yeah, let's see. Does uh, many people not talk about the knowledge, right? Many kind of knowledge, triple down knowledge. But uh, from the technical part of view, I'm curious, is there any stable, how can you encode knowledge? What's kind of the knowledge that the machine can learn from this? Because anyway, the machine can understand the knowledge, you talk to them, right? You talk about the knowledge, every knowledge, even if you talk about the knowledge to me, if a younger boy I cannot understand anything, right? So how could the machine can learn the knowledge from you, which under tablet format under the phone, and how they can conflict with, how they can resolve conflict with what they already learn from the data from say, well, you you don't want to destroy everything and build from scratch, right? Because your AI system has already learned from the data and from the other knowledge. How you can you know now you input the knowledge, how you obey them, they can obey you, right? Right? So this is what I'm curious. About. So that, that is a very big question, right? So um, once uh, we, we establish that the system needs knowledge, we still need to decide as a developer, or as a manager, okay, which part of the system um, has the, needs the knowledge or can use some good knowledge and in what form, right? So for example, if you train a deep learning model that is input data, that is a, a, a processing function flowing through various layers, and there's a cost function, right? So knowledge can actually go into any of those steps. 
So, for example, in the in the architecture that we that I presented just now about the predictive maintenance system, the knowledge that is used is uh, basically the description of the expert of when uh, folds can be seen reliably from some data, uh, from data that is observed. Right? They can use that in words, or they can write out a, a piece of uh, Python. Uh, or some, some, some structured forms that indicate that folks. Right? And we can use that knowledge in the following form. We can um, use that uh, knowledge teacher to create the labels to, 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 to augment the data from which the machine learning model, this, the, which is a student model, can learn from. Right? So, um, so, so in that pipeline, uh, the, the role of, of the knowledge is the source of label uh, uh, data. For, for the machine learning part of the pipeline. In, in other use cases, uh, let's say, uh, in when we try to do um, uh, environmental-friendly fishing, um, then that knowledge can be used in other forms. For example, knowledge can inform how we segment the data. Uh, knowledge can be used to, to adjust or post-process the predictions after some preliminary predictions are turned out by machine learning models. So, um, overall, what I can say is that, first of all, you need to decide which parts of the program or the pipeline can, can use uh, some good knowledge. Uh, secondly, you need to encode the knowledge in the form that that section of the pipeline can consume. Okay? Uh, you, you, you need to decide whether the knowledge can be left as a natural language form or should be translated to some domain-specific language in order to be processed um, efficiently. So it is an emerging art that we are practicing, and, and hopefully there will be uh, some very good recommendations um, as as we uh, as we collect our wisdom. So. Okay, maybe one more question. <laughs> Thanks, Vin, for that talk. So you you highlighted three three out of that the five I think right AI rule uh, components. So I'm just curious, where does these uh, applications come from in terms of like in, in terms of an actual implementation that you could see in this some, sometime in the near future, right? Mm. How how would you do it? Where, where would the best use case come from, and, and what would that look like? So I think that question is. Um Okay, how do you, are you asking when you have a, a, a basic machine learning system, how, how do we make it more compliant or or, some, or how do you actually um, so, plan for such a system? So not how do we make it compliant per se, but uh, if, if you're building a product that has to incorporate some of these uh, uh, trustworthiness uh, components in it, right? Like, like, do we have like formal frameworks for them right now that, that could be taken and then built upon, or or is there some uh, pathway? I'm just trying to see from framework to an actual runnable system. Like, how do we bridge that gap, and then where's that uh, use case going to come from, essentially? Um, in terms of the tooling uh, for for these uh, the kind of standards compliance, uh, we can think of two families of tools. Um, that can be used uh, or will be invented uh, as part of this uh, this industry or this uh, part of the uh, practice of AI. The first is developers' tool, right? So those tools, uh, there will be tools for making um, your system recordable, right? Recording the the entire flow of what's happening in the system. That is uh, uh, that that can be used for an audit, for example. Uh, there will be tools for tweaking uh, the data sets or the, the, the model uh, the techniques to make them more de-biased, right? So those are developers' tools. There will be also audit tools used by managers and, and auditors and regulators um, in, 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 in the sense that quite similar to what was mentioned by uh, Dr. Raikani earlier, right? So those tools will be run on the, the outputs um, of the systems um, 
when, when these systems are audited in the future and say, okay, is this system fair? Is this system auditable, right? Uh, how, how deeply auditable it is? Uh, is this system controllable by human knowledge? Or is it run by a wild uh, machine learning model? And so so uh, we, we can, I can anticipate those two umbrellas of tools precisely what will be used, uh, we have to see. These are very early days. Yeah. Just, I'm not so sure. I'll make a brief comment um, on your answer there, which is, I know it's not fun or sexy to talk about machine learning on structured data, but I think that's still a lot of what we do. Mm -hmm. And for that kind of machine learning, there are now interpretable models that, that surpass the accuracy of black boxes. So just for instance, like explainable boosting machines and gammy nets and additive neural networks and all these kinds of things. So I would just highlight that that's that's one thing that's already happened. Like, mm -hmm. like essentially, there's no reason to use black box machine learning on structured data anymore. In many cases, in many cases. Yep. So, so that that those models will become more of a mainstay yes. um, to to make the system, let's say, more more explainable, right, or more describable in the understanding sense. But but they but that alone will not answer other aspects of trustworthiness. For example, it, how, how can we be sure that that's auditable? Um, how does that make it more fair, right? So, so these are orthogonal dimensions. One tool can, can help with one or two dimensions. Very few tools can do six. Um, arguably, probably there will be no tools that we can do six. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.